See those guys talking about that 62 model? Well, the one on the left, Bob Hogarth, he's pretty sharp on brakes. And Russ Newton there knows transmissions like the back of his hand. Let's listen in. And these are known as servo contact brakes, Russ. They're new on Plymouths and Dodges this year. They look just like bigger versions of the brakes that have been used on Valiants and Lancers, don't they? Well, they are, with some added features. For example, there's no pedal-free play adjustment, even with power brakes this year, and all linings are bonded. But I think the most important thing on these new Plymouth and Dodge brakes is this new automatic brake adjuster that keeps the brake shoe clearance set correctly. This maintains pedal height as the linings wear down. It's also available in a kit for dealer installation on Valiants and Lancers. So look for it when servicing brakes on these cars, too. This automatic brake adjuster is designed to prevent over-adjustment. In other words, any service problem will be one of no adjustment. If the adjuster doesn't work, look for these things. The adjuster cable may have slipped off its guide on the secondary shoe. The adjuster lever may be bent, or the threads on the brake adjuster may be corroded, preventing the star wheel from turning. Now, to test the automatic adjuster, Pry the secondary shoe away from the anchor pin a sixteenth of an inch or more and let it return. As it returns, the lever should turn the star wheel. After testing, disengage the lever from the star wheel and back off the star wheel to its previous setting. Suppose you have to back off the star wheel during adjustment, Bob, after installing new brake linings, for example. Do you have to remove the brake drum to disengage the adjuster lever? No, that's not necessary, Russ. Just stick a thin screwdriver through the adjusting hole in the support plate and hold the lever away from the star wheel while you turn it back. Remember, you might also find the automatic adjuster on any Valiant or Lancer, so check for it before backing off the brakes on these cars. I imagine it's always a good idea to check for all the usual sources of brake trouble, like uh, contaminated linings, out-of-round drums, and a faulty hydraulic system when you're troubleshooting these brakes. That's right, Russ. And here's another tip. If you find any water or rust in the front wheel bearings when you're servicing them, be sure the two plastic foam seals in the front brake support plate are okay. Now, there's a flat washer-shaped seal behind the center of the support plate. If the seal is damaged, put in a new one. And if this seal between the upper edge of the cup and the support plate is leaking, You'll have to dig out as much of the old seal as possible and reseal that section with a non-hardening sealer, such as Permatex number 2. Hey, this seal's damaged, isn't it? Look at those torn edges. <laughs> no, that's okay, Russ. The fresh seal looks like this with two tabs on it. They're removed during assembly at the factory, leaving those rough edges. Now let's look at the rear wheel brakes. New washer-shaped plastic foam seals are used at the rear brake support plates, too. But now, let's review the adjustment of these new cable-operated parking brakes. Begin by making sure the service brakes are adjusted right. Then release the parking brake and be sure both rear wheels turn freely. Then, back off the lock nut and tighten the adjusting nut at the cable equalizer until the rear wheels are hard to turn. This takes the slack out of the cables. Next, loosen the adjusting nut just enough so that the wheels turn freely without dragging. Then, tighten the lock nut. Test the adjustment by operating the parking brake several times. And uh, talking about parking reminds me, there's a new parking lock on the Plymouth and Dodge torque flight transmissions. What's the story on that? It's a good one, Bob. This lever on the instrument panel is mounted on the push-button box. When you apply the parking lock, the lever operates the cable to engage a pawl with a sprag gear on the transmission output shaft. At the control box, the control lever pivot is a cam, which permits easy adjustment. And the new cable has a tough plastic housing with a hard metal end. Always handle the cable with your hands. Never use pliers or other tools that could cut the plastic housing. Well, how about servicing this parking lock, Russ? Well, as usual, when troubleshooting most any piece of equipment, you'll want to look for the most obvious and the easiest things first. Start with the cable. Check it for kinks, particularly near the upper end, and for damage. These things can cause hard operation. 
If the parking lock won't work at all, check the cable connections here at the control box and at the transmission, too. To check the transmission connection, move the lock handle to the off position to keep from spilling too much transmission fluid in the next step. Loosen the clamp nut and tap the nut to free the cable ferrule. Then pull the cable to see if the cable tip is locked in the adapter. If it's disconnected, put the lever in the park position and push the cable in until the tip locks in the adapter. Next, adjust the cable. Put the lock handle at the instrument panel in the off position. Then with the clamp loose, pull the cable away from the transmission as far as possible and release it before you tighten the clamp nut. Don't over tighten the nut. 10 to 15 inch pounds is enough. Here's another point. Be sure the lever handle doesn't hit either end of its slot in the instrument panel. You can adjust this by loosening these two nuts and moving the handle. Then tighten the nuts. But when you're checking the lever handle for clearance, remember this. The handle should rub lightly against one side of the slot in the instrument panel to prevent rattling. But if the cable connections are good and the lever handle has end clearance, what then? Then I'd suggest that you take the control box out of the car and look for damaged parts. And while you're at it, check the control lever adjustment. First, apply lubriplate to the neutral slide pin and bushing, the cam pivot, both ends of all slides, and both ends of the over-center spring if it's needed. Then, remove the over-center spring and hold the neutral slide full in, pushing on the forked end of the slide. Give it a slight clockwise twist to turn the neutral slide pin upward. With the slide held in that position, operate the control lever a few times. And watch the lever nose as it passes the neutral slide pin. The lever nose should just barely touch the pin in passing. It shouldn't hang up on the pin. To adjust this, loosen the cam jam nut until it's only snug. Then, change the cam position to get the correct lever nose clearance and tighten the jam nut to 95 inch pounds. For the cam to be set correctly, the high point indicator on the cam should end up pointing forward somewhere between the seven o'clock and one o'clock positions. Finally, Put the lever in the park position and adjust the lever stop screw to give a ten thousandths gap between the neutral slide pin and the lever heel. Tighten the lock nut to 20 inch pounds and install the over center spring. And when you install the box, make certain the handle clears both ends of the slot in the instrument panel. Also, don't damage or kink the cable and be sure it's secured in the body clip to keep it from sagging toward the exhaust pipe. Here's one more point. If you find signs of leaking transmission fluid, check the O-ring at the lower end of the cable. If it's damaged, you'll lose lubricant there. Okay, Russ. But say, speaking of control cables, how about the transmission control cable adjustment for this new V8 torque flight? It's just like the procedure for last year's torque flight six, Bob. But once again, you've got to be sure the cable isn't too close to the exhaust system. And as soon as someone turns this record over, we'll hear what else Russ knows about this new torque flight transmission for the eight-cylinder engines. Say, Russ, what have you found out about this new torque flight transmission for eight-cylinder engines? It's got a lot of advantages, Bob, but most important to us is the fact that it's much easier to service. It's quite similar in basic design to the Torque Flight 6 we've had for two years. Pressure tests, band adjustments, and overhaul procedures are similar, too. There are notable differences in some of the parts, though. Annulus gears in this new unit, for example, are of rugged, welded construction, and the planet pinion thrust washers are heavy-duty steel-backed bronze. Clutches in this new transmission have a larger diameter, the front clutch has waved clutch discs and multiple return springs. The overrunning clutch assembly has a serrated rim which is pressed into the transmission case so it can be easily serviced. Also, there's a shield over the vent between the transmission case and the torque converter housing. The output shaft runs in a ball bearing at the rear and it pilots with the input shaft at the front. 
Those are just some of the more obvious features, Bob. Throughout, this new transmission's built to handle V8 engine torque. Thanks, Russ. That information should help a lot during overhaul. And say, speaking of overhaul, what's new on that subject? Well, for one thing, pre-finished service bushings are available for this new transmission, as well as all Torque Flight 6s. This is a good service feature, because you don't have to burnish them. But just be sure you use this new bushing removing and installing tool set. Yeah, and you'll need this repair stand adapter, too, as well as these other special tools for the eight-cylinder transmission. That's right, Tech. They're important, too. Remember that the output shaft flange must always be installed to make sure you get a true reading when you check the end play of the input shaft on this new torque flight job. You can't install this front clutch piston with a twisting motion, so just apply a thin film of Mopar or Crico door ease all around the lip of the piston seal, and you'll find it'll slip straight into place without damaging the seal. And finally, the valve body and transfer plate assemblies for six-cylinder and eight-cylinder transmissions look alike, but they're not interchangeable. If you try to install the wrong one, this center mounting hole in the rear of the transfer plate won't line up with the hole in the case. Well, I guess that takes care of automatic transmissions, Russ. But what about manual transmissions? The Chrysler Newport with manual transmission has kept the tunnel-mounted shift lever, and there's no change in the way it's adjusted either. One big difference this year is that Plymouth, Dodge, Valiant, and Lancer have a new column-mounted gear shift linkage. Well, on these new column-mounted linkages, I've noticed that the shift tube has been replaced with a concentric tube inside the steering column jacket. But what else is new? Well, the driver's gear shift lever pivots differently, and the positions of the two shift levers are reversed from last year. The low and reverse lever is now below the second and high lever. And on the Plymouth and Dodge, the second and high control rod is attached to a torque shaft which operates the transmission shift lever. Among other things, this isolates the driver's gear shift lever from engine vibration. Sounds good, Russ. But now, how do you adjust this new linkage? Quite simple, Bob. There are a number of points to check, but don't waste time adjusting anything that's okay. First, be sure the column jacket is centered on the steering shaft. If you have to adjust this, loosen the screws that attach the steering column floor plate to the tow board. Then, shift the jacket as necessary and tighten the screws to 90 inch pounds. Next, check the position of the gear shift lever in neutral. It should be five degrees above horizontal on Plymouth and Dodge and 10 degrees on Valiant and Lancer. Of course, you can change this position to suit the individual customer if necessary. To adjust the neutral position, disconnect the control rod swivel from the second and high lever and move the gear shift lever to the desired position. Then, loosen the lock nut and screw the swivel up or down to line up the swivel stud with the hole in the lever. Then, attach the swivel Installing the parts on the swivel stud in this order. First, a flat washer and the anti-rattle washer. Then, on the other side of the shift lever, another flat washer and a spring clip. Tighten the swivel lock nut to 70 inch pounds. Use the same sequence of attaching parts when connecting the low and reverse rod to its lever. Next, check the shift levers for axial looseness by trying to tilt one of them parallel to the steering column. If there's more than one sixteenth of an inch of play measured at the tip of the lever, loosen the two bushing retaining screws and turn the plastic bushing down by hand, just enough to remove all end play. When you're turning the bushing, hold the screws back against the upper edges of the slots in the column jacket. That way, you won't leave any room for them to slide back out of adjustment after they're tightened. Right, Tech. Then, hold the bushing in this position and tighten the screws to 30-inch pounds only, or you'll strip the threads in the bushing. Next, check for smooth crossover operation. Remember how that's done, Bob? Oh, sure. Just move the gear shift lever back and forth several times in neutral while holding a slight downward pressure on the lever. 
Then repeat the test with a slight upward pressure. That's it. And if it feels lumpy, you'll have to adjust the low and reverse rod swivel at the transmission. The first step is to wedge the selector lever in neutral halfway between the two shift levers to keep the shift levers lined up during adjustment. Then loosen the swivel clamp on the low and reverse rod at the transmission. Be sure the low and reverse lever at the transmission is in neutral. Then wiggle the lever slightly to make certain the detent ball is fully seated in the neutral notch in the lever cam. Next, slide the low and reverse control rod gently back and forth through the swivel to find the mid backlash point. Hold the rod there and tighten the clamp screw to 100 inch pounds. Finally, remove the wedge from the selector lever and lubricate all moving parts with lubra plate if they need it. And to wrap up the job, test the adjustment by shifting into all gears with the engine off. Operate the clutch on each shift to be sure there's no binding or interference. Well, that covers it, Bob. Okay, Russ. And thanks a lot for sharing those transmission service tips with me. Oh, I'm just paying you back for all that brake information, Bob. And your advice was appreciated too, Tech. Glad to help you fellas. <laughs> but I'd like to add just one more point. In today's stop-and-go driving, your service customers need top performance from their brakes and transmissions. So use the information in this session to keep them happy with their stopping and going. That's another step in building a successful and profitable dealership.